Nowadays, everyone plays their home video game consoles online. Xbox and PlayStation have crafted the perfect system for years now. You pay about $60 a year to play your video games online with friends or random people. You get to use online apps like Netflix and voice chat with friends wherever you want to. Sometimes you get the occasional free game as well to play monthly. These two titans have perfected and crafted this formula for the past three generations. And then there's Nintendo. Either way, online console gaming has become such a pivotal part of the industry and the current trajectory of gaming as a whole. Where did all of this start, though? Well, believe it or not, online gaming was around in some form as far back as the beginning of console gaming. Gaming computers were kind of always a thing, and some of them had some sort of online functionality, but today we're looking at dedicated home gaming consoles that had online functionality. To start, look no further than the Atari 2600. This console as a whole did so much, more than you'd think for something so simple. There were wireless controllers, a cassette player, a voice module, and all to play breathtaking games like this. And of course, there was a peripheral that put you online because, well, why not? The game line was released roughly in 1983. It would connect via a telephone line, and once that came up, you had to enter a serial code. You did have to pay money to use the service. According to this manual, if you can't reach customer service, you're given a $25 credit. Hello, and welcome to the Atari Game Line line. This is for you. Are you looking to play your games online? That's why we call it the Game Line. How many Damn, couldn't get a hold of them. Each month with the service, you would be able to play a variety of games and even get sneak peeks of future games coming out. Each session played did cost money. The example they use in the manual is Atlantis. You can play this game eight times for one dollar. Not the worst deal in the world, but you already pay for the service, right? It'd be like paying for Netflix and still having to pay money for a movie on top of that. On your birthday, though, you get a free play session. Kind of a nice feature, honestly, but probably easy to exploit. Yes, so today is my birthday, tomorrow is my mom's birthday, the day after is my dad's birthday, the day after that is my brother's birthday, so after that we're canceling the service, okay? Sounds good. Each play session, though, could last as long as you wanted it to, meaning there's not any real time limit once you start the game. I've been up for 20 hours trying to beat Pong. Every fifth game played, you get a sixth for free. Wow, what a deal! There were even contests for this, and if you won one, you'd be invited to a regional playoffs, but what kind of sucks is you have to pay money to enter the contests and another fee to submit your best score. So it's kind of cool, but really, this is just an ancient example of a complete scam. This could get really pricey really quickly, since if you want to win, you're going to be paying 50 cents to submit your score over and over again, and even then, you're probably just going to lose. But games are not all with this service. There was an electronic mail service, information on sports, a stock market app, there was a freaking banking service, you could see airline services and read the news. Who needs a computer, right? Bust out your Atari! Well, unfortunately, not all of these features came to fruition. Part of the reason this concept failed was the video game crash in the mid-1980s. Not only was owning an Atari becoming less enticing, but when games themselves were becoming only a few dollars at a local store, who really wants to spend money on this service for just a few plays? Still though, this was very ahead of its time, someone had to be the first, and really fascinating that this was on the Atari of all things. There was even what was probably the world's first planned digital exclusive game, Save the Whales, but it never came out. Intellivision, which of course copied everything Atari did, had their own online service, this being called the Intellivision Play Cable. This was very costly for its time. Not only was there a $25 fee to activate it, there was a $12 fee to use the service monthly. And this was in the 80s, so inflation has a huge impact if you compared it to today's standards. The advertisement was shockingly ahead of its time. There's lots of video games out today. Some are better than others. But with most games costing $25 or more, the best way to play is without cartridges on Play Cable. For less than half the price of one game, you get 20 great games a month, over $500 worth. Over $500 worth of what? Well, I mean, I guess that's true. I mean, these games did cost a lot upon release. Theoretically, this is a good deal and honestly reminds me of the Xbox Game Pass. I said theoretically. Well, unfortunately, while it was a good concept and ahead of its time, that was its downfall. It was too ahead of its time. With internet connections at this time being complete garbage, something like this was just not viable and it didn't run very well. Also, as bigger and better games released in the console's lifespan, online was just not able to support them very well anymore. Cute idea, but the world was just not ready for something like this. When the subscription ended, cable companies asked for people who had these to return them. What? Just end the service. Do you want to reuse the plastic or something? Are there parts of these 
Italian television Amico? Like, how would you even mandate that? Did people get fined if they didn't even have any more? What if you gave it to the dog or something? Of course, Nintendo needed to get their hands on a piece of this pie. Nintendo, in the late 1980s, viewed the Famicom as something that should be as prevalent as something the likes of a telephone. It's very fair to note at this time, video game console generations weren't really a thing yet, so the future of these consoles was extremely up in the air. So Japan ended up getting the Famicom Network System. Nothing like this ended up coming out in North America, but was talked about at one point. The system was less about games and more so about services. This was another console adapter that would connect to the stock market. Was there a genuine market? for these? Did people really use these consoles for the frickin' stock market? I mean, come on, you could just go to a stock exchange or just boot up your Atari and Famicom and just, just, just go on the stock market? I mean, there were games that played online with the Famicom, but there's not a lot of information about these. Again, this was more of a service that was trying to turn the Famicom from a game console to a computer. And a service it was. You could access information about the weather, cheat codes, told jokes. Who's, who's there? In the US, it was even planned that you could buy lottery tickets with this. Very American. Anyways, this isn't a surprise, but it failed. The president of Nintendo of Japan said, It is just a matter of time. When people are ready for it, we have the network in place.